Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the ninth session of the Transatlantic Virtual Event Series, Road to Election Night and Beyond, which is jointly organized, as you saw on the, on the welcome slide, by uh, numerous transatlantic institutions and political foundations in Germany. And tonight we aim to further foster debate on a strong transatlantic uh, relationship and partnership. I'd like to give a special thanks to Rudiger Lenz of the Aspen Institute in Berlin, who was uh, instrumental with his team in initiating and doing the heavy lifting in organizing this special cooperation. As always, Rudiger, great job. Thank you very, very much. Uh, tonight's panel discussion on why trade matters, the future of transatlantic economic relations will be moderated by Annette Meiritz, who you also see on your screen. She is based in Washington, DC, has been there since November, 2017, as the US correspondent for the Handelsblatt. And prior to that, she has uh, uh, spent 10 years working at Spiegel Online. So she's a very experienced uh, journalist and uh, is also uh, a parliamentary correspondent. It's certainly no secret to any of you, uh, particularly if you've been following uh, the activities of the MGM or the other member members of these of this series or seen any the other uh, uh, sessions we did that uh, transatlantic trade is vitally important to our world. It secures 15 million jobs and accounts for about 30% of global trade. And we all know that uh, the major amounts of global investments in the US over 50% of investments in the US inbound come from Europe, 64% of US investments go to Europe. So I think we've all adequately learned and there should no longer be any debate that free rule-based trade ensures value creation and prosperity on both sides of the, of the Atlantic. Uh, unfortunately, for some years now, there's been a trend towards protectionism in world trade and turning away from multilateralism beyond uh, just being a policy that is, just doesn't make sense, it also endangers the close ties between Europe and the United States. We're also confronted with, uh, 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 in Europe, seeing ourselves between two blocks, the US on China, and I think it's becoming more obvious that this political confrontation is one that needs to be resolved on a transatlantic level with the United States in Europe working hand in hand and also with a functioning World Trade Organization as a guarantor of uh, uh, open world trade. The, the member companies of the MCM are committed to the principles of uh, open and value-based transatlantic relations, a Europe capable of action and solidarity and free and world-based trade. So understandably, President-elect Biden will have enormous amount of uh, challenges domestically, of course, COVID and the situation in the United States, which is right now not easy. And he also has uh, domestic economic issues, which will certainly uh, occupy much of his time. But having said that, it's important that we restart the transatlantic relationships rethink our common interests and our common challenges. I think the German government is called to try and increase Germany's role within the EU, EU as a leader and to be one of the voices calling out for strengthened transatlantic ties and trade. And we need to continue dialogue and not just dialogue, but also cooperation. Uh, obviously, we're in favor of dismantling the penal tariffs and non-trade barriers that have been erected, not just in the past four years. And uh, we don't believe necessarily that there needs to be a TTIP 2.0, but we need to be responsive to the way the world is changing with new growing and future order oriented industries and their, their needs. And we need to find a way to act internationally to help our alliance succeed. So with that, as an introduction again, I thank all of you for coming. I'm sure we're gonna have a very informative session. When you see the people that we've got here, we've got Germans who have gone to the US, uh, 
Germans who have been in the US and come back. We've got a mix of people, an extremely interesting panel, which Annette will in, uh, introduce here in a minute. I'm sure there's gonna be some great insights for you. And I look forward to uh, the next hour or so to see what we can all learn together. So Annette, the word is yours. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, it's been quite a year for every one of us. And um, I'm glad to have such an extraordinary, great panel here at the end of the year, uh, hoping for a change next year um, on different levels. Um, just a short remark beforehand. Uh, you probably see that your microphones um, and the videos are muted. They are muted by default. But you have the opportunity to type in written questions in this little chat win window. Um, and I'll try to uh, answer, uh, to let those questions answered live. Uh, we probably won't have time to answer every question, but we'll do our best. Uh, and with that, I'd like to start to introduce the panelists. And first of all, we have uh, Mr. Daniel Andre here, who as of November 1st took over as a general manager at the MGM Germany. And I think it's not too, say, not too late to say congratulations. Um, and uh, before that, uh, he served as a representative of the German industry and trade in Washington, D.C. in the probably most challenging times you can imagine. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, then we have um, Dr. Christina Gomlich. She's the deputy head of the BISF Berlin office for corporate government relations. And she's been working there in different leading uh, positions for over 15 years. And I've, I found her legal background very interesting too, which probably comes in handy when trying to understand the fine prints of the trade war. Um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for being here as well. Then we have uh, Dr. Hans Grandin. Um, who's the CEO of the Husker Group, one of the world's leading manufacturers of technical tecti textiles. And Dr. Grandin has an impressive engineering background, by the way, um, and he also worked and lived in the US for 10 years. And then last but not least, we have uh, Peter Riele, the president and the CEO of Wittenstein North America a global leader in industrial motion systems. Um, and uh, the, the America headquarter is based in the state of Illinois, a very relevant region trade-wise. And you've been living in the US since 1970, 1997. So you've probably seen it all. Thank you and good morning from Chicago. So for the beginning, for a change, I would like to start actually on a positive note because we've seen so many negative news this year. Um, and I would like to ask each of our panelists to shortly wrap, wrap up um, that when you look back to this rather challenging year, is there anything you are thankful for in regard to your profession or company? Maybe we start with Dr. Gomlich. Um, yeah, hi. Um, hi. Thank you, Annette, um, for asking. Um, I, th I think. Um, Looking back at this year and um, taking the international perspective, the most positive thing um, is that I see Europe is finally finding its role in um, the transatlantic and also um, yeah, ch Chinese um, um, geopolitical struggle. Um, and see seeing that we have um, these two huge um, economies um, with which Europe is competing and um, which have both put us um, to, yeah, towards some um, very challenging tasks. Um, Europe is, um, yeah, is identifying now um, and is finding its role and deciding to take a position. And I think this is very, um, this is a very good position um, for Europe um, to have and, um, and to start working with um, concerning, the, uh, concerning the positions that we, and, and the challenges that we see um, we're facing now um, with the new U.S. administration coming up and also um, on finding a joint take um, on China. Dr. Gandhi, would you like to follow on that? Well, I guess um, when we think of 2020, uh, there's a, um, an American saying which I would make a variance to, and that's 2020 didn't come with instructions. Yeah, so we... <laughs> We, uh, we started sometime in February, March, all of a sudden, uh, yeah, Corona broke over us. And I, I think um, that I'm thankful that somehow we managed this time and we managed uh, how to deal with it. And we also managed how to deal with, let's say, yeah, the political um, noise that we had from the US administration and uh, combined 
with all the restrictions that we just heard from Mr. Sportulari. So I think um, I'm very happy that there was no harm to our team during this time. And there was also no harm to our company in this time. And again, uh, we had to learn many new things about many things that we never thought about one year, uh, one year ago. Yeah, and we had to learn it very fast. So I'm so happy that we that we managed that and talking about our company. Um, actually, I think we come out stronger because uh, yeah, we had the opportunity to refocus and say what do we do? Do we good? Do we do good and what not? And um, yeah, and we kept also our business going during that uh, during that time with maybe some concepts that are not so usual. So I'm happy about that. And Mr. Riele, anything positive on your side? Yeah, absolutely. And I can only underline what Mr. Grandin just once said. There was no blueprint, so so speaking, for that situation, which uh, started here February and March. And as a, a, we have a production here in Illinois, we have 120 people. Uh, so we produce 75% of the products sold in, in the United States here. But we are still dependent on, on our colleagues in Germany, and they were hit earlier uh, in the year with COVID-19. But I have to say uh, our team, uh, especially our IT infrastructure, enabled us to uh, work from the home offices. Uh, and with the measures in place, we split up production. We were able uh, not to shut down production at all. We are uh, considered essential business here. Uh, we are delivering uh, uh, products into the medical industry, uh, in the food and, and uh, food processing packaging industry. Um, and we were able uh, to run the production without any interruptions here. We had close calls, so speaking, uh, but we managed it. Uh, and uh, I'm thankful for our team, our employees, that they handled it, uh, that stress uh, so far very, very well. Uh, because there are a lot of sacrifices um, for every individual and it's not easy we cannot travel we have to do everything virtually with our customers customer service but the it enabled us uh, and we had no struggles uh, to work uh, remote uh, as need in the offices production is a different story but we managed it as well and uh, as mr Plantin said there was time also to restructure to rethink certain processes um, and adapt immediately. Also the speed of adaption, I think, uh, was very well done. Uh, supply chain, still a challenge. We still become key components in Germany. Uh, and as you know, air freight uh, quadrupled uh, in price uh, immediately. Uh, but um, probably uh, we are coming to uh, that at the uh, at a later uh, point. So, um, so far, uh, so good. Um, it, nobody knew what's coming. Once again, there's no blueprint for it. And Mr. Andrich. Yeah, thank you. I couldn't agree more what everybody said before and underscore just the fact that I'm very grateful that everybody uh, stayed safe and healthy in our office back in DC when everything started, but also here with Amcham in Frankfurt and Berlin. So I will keep it short and simple on the positive note is that my personal supply chain worked absolutely fine. Kudos to the logistics uh, uh, on the transatlantic level. My belongings arrived in Bremerhaven from Baltimore Harbor and now in Rhein-Main Gebiet. So I can reassure you that logistics work. I mean, it might differ to some degree when you look at the supply and the intermediate products you need. But from this point of view, I've been very thankful to receive my uh, removal. Sounds good. Um... Dr. Gomlich, I'm, I'm so interested in your perspective um, from an international large uh, company like BASF. Like, what is your estimate? How long is, is it going to take to fix the damage of the trade war combined um, with a pandemic for a company like, like yours? Like, do you have an estimate and a, and a view into the future for us? I wish I had, of course, um, but um, I think I can't really give that. I mean, um, the past year has been very challenging, and um, we still see the, um, yeah, and, and we still see what the, the impact um, in in our value chains, and um, we also see it in our um, 
We also see when in, in, in our customers um, and what happened in the customer industries, especially when it comes to automotive, um, what has happened. Um, so, um, so, so to really give an outlook, I think um, we're happy to say that we think that there will be a positive outlook at some point. And we've um, actually, we obviously, ha we again have an outlook um, in our own um, business. Um, which we couldn't um, give, um, I think, at the half-year press conference. Um, so we changed that. I think that is um, positive. Um, I think all in all, we're probably going to take two or three years, maybe four. I don't know, to rebound, how long did we take after the last crisis? I mean, um, I think it all now depends on um, how how quickly we actually get the vaccination going, um, how quickly we, we get um, immunity in in. Yeah, in our economies, and then how quickly we um, restart business, and um, and also, of course, deal with the challenges that are out there. And I mean, because we're not only talking about um, COVID and the COVID recovery, we're also talking about um, yeah the digitization um, challenge, um, and and we're talking about climate um, and cl climate change. So it's um, it's not called the twin transition in Europe um, for no reason. And um, yeah, and then of course we have the geopolitical challenge and the trade challenges um, to WTO, um, yeah, to uh, in in the US um, European trade, um, yeah, I'm going to call it trade war um, that that has been going on, and also of course what's going on within um, US and China and um, the relations that are um, that that have been challenging there too. Um, so um, yeah, so there's a lot out there, a lot to address. Um, but um, I think what's good about this is that because everything is changing and um, everything, everyone is aware that we are in fact transitioning from an old world into a somewhat new world, and we, we can actually address everything and start reordering everything. And I think that's a huge chance that we have as, um, as a society and, um, as, as, or as societies, um, be, it, be it the US, the European or the Asian societies, and um, so there's a, lot, there's a lot going on there, um, a lot new coming up. We have RCEP now um, and the signal that that's sending. So, um, yeah, so, so um, I think there's, um, it, it'll be a challenge to recover, but I think we have a lot, um, lot of um, loose ends to tie together that can actually help us recover to, to, to an actually new world order, put it, to put it very optimistically. Thank you for this for this overview. We will come back to China and also to the Biden presidency. Your expectations uh, from all of you uh, in a minute. But I'm interested um, on your view, Mr. Rila, because you are you living you you live in the U.S. and you have your business there and you know so many partners there um, who live there as well. So I was wondering. Um, we had such a challenging time with the trade war and Mr. Trump, for example, or President Trump called Europe worse than China when it comes to when it comes to trade and he put all these tariffs into place. Was there ever a time within the last three or four years where you and your company didn't feel welcome anymore anymore in the US? Uh, <clears throat> no, not really, uh, because, <clears throat> you know, business is business, Also, we didn't feel it from our customers. But uh, we, we, we felt the, the trade wars and the climate. Um, give you an example, tariffs on aluminum and steel. Uh, we, we need a lot of, uh, we produce a lot with uh, aluminum here and the prices went up. Uh, the tariffs were, were not even in place, but the distributors in the United States take immediately advantage of that. So the distribution centers, they, they uh, check up the price and it's actually damaging your own industry in the United States. So that's uh, counterproductive. We felt also uh, with the visa policy, when we get specialists over, application engineers, aerospace system engineers, we have a hard time uh, um, uh, in the last years, uh, especially the last two years, uh, to get on a quick note uh, someone over to help and transfer the knowledge and expertise to service our US customers here, including the US government. Um, and, and, uh, and we hope, uh, that's my hope, and that's the hope also of our members uh, with a new administration, that will quickly change. Uh, there are other things uh, which have to change. Um, uh, one in particular is the uncertainty. Also, uh, the tweets of uh, threatening with uh, uh, tariffs, uh, and, and that's, this uncertainty is pure German gift, poison, or uh, uh, 
uh, companies like us and others, uh, because you cannot plan, you have no stable, stability, and, and that's a big, big problem. And we hope that this will change very quickly. Dr. Gandin, I will ask you in a minute about your um, expectations on the Biden administration. But first of all, maybe a quick note from Daniel Andrich, uh, because you, you know DC so well and the, the mechanisms in DC. Um, do you think that a new Biden administration will even have the time or the focus at the beginning to really focus on the trade issue, especially with the European Union, with all that's going on, the pandemic and China? What is your take on that? When, when, will, when will Biden... Um, start to start his work with the trade issue issue i mean uh, i think there's not one single trade sort of topic uh, to not say uh, issue here um, you know there have been a lot of trade uh, um, situations created over the last three and a half years some issues have been in place for many many years before this administration took over uh, almost four years ago um, so i think that the and uh, i guess you know Peter Riele in the US and others will, will probably allude on that, but um, the Biden administration will probably focus very much on domestic issues in the first place. That's at least what we have uh, perceived here and read about what their plan is uh, within the 100 days. Obviously COVID is a huge uh, issue and how to deal with it, but also to stabilize the economy in the US, uh, which um, is heavily um, infected by domestic demand Uh, rather than by trade relationship in the first place. Um, there have been um, so many tariffs imposed on China that I think that China will stay rather uh, um, you know, a major topic for the Biden administration too, how to deal with China. Um, I'm very hopeful that the you know, style and communication and tone within cooperation you know, towards the EU will increase uh, with a Biden administration. But this also put in place Brussels and Berlin and Paris and work all together and come up with a strategy to how to interact with the US administration and how to sort of think about common interests, and joint approaches on many different multilateral issues we're facing in the, in the you know, for businesses who are active around the globe. So I think there's a huge opportunity for us here within German business, the transatlantic business community to Uh, to work with the uh, new administration and to work with the Bundesregierung and the EU Commission uh, to have a positive agenda as it was uh, uh, laid out by, I think, Charles, Charles Michel uh, in the last couple of days. So I'm, I'm upbeat. Dr. Grandin, so there might be a fresh start on Janu January 21st, but we all know that um, the president-elect Biden has a lot of protectionism in his program as well. He's not a real free trader, so to, so to speak. How worried are you about that um, from, a, from, a, from a perspective um, of a medium-sized business? Um, for you, it's very important to have free trade and open trade borders. So, so what, what is your view on that? Are you a bit worried that we might not see a fresh start? Well, actually, <clears throat> I'm not worried, I'm excited. <laughs> and and uh, and but I'm not excited because I think there will be radical changes on the political side, yeah. Because like we just mentioned, there are also protectionist um, elements of Biden's program. But I think first and foremost, it's very important that we come back to an let's say an educated and reasonable way to deal with each other, yeah. Because this hostile let's say, way to deal with each other and the threats and, and all this is, is extremely difficult um, uh, for us to do business. And as a smaller or mid-sized company, we don't have, you know, the, the large staff of, of consultants and whatever who, tells, who tell us what to do in which uh, direction. We have to somehow adapt to the, to the situation. And to be honest, in the last four years, and I have talked to many other people who are in a similar situation like us, the last two years, our business in the States was not harmed. Yeah, there was a lot of political noise and threats and all these things, but um, we, uh, our tariffs were not affected by uh, the tariffs that were put in place. And to be honest, the EU has also certain tariffs. Try to bring back your car from the US when you move back. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, 
the, I, I think there's more talk about this and more threat. And I actually, I was worried if this continues the next four years, but um, at the moment, I think the whole, um, yeah, the whole tone of the relationship will relax. And, um, and um, I don't think, um, I can only see an upside potential. Yeah, and uh, like Mr. Andrich also said, and um, so I'm not worried about this. I think we can now concentrate, and we will talk about this later, how maybe Europe and the US can hook up, how we can strengthen the WTO and these things. I think that will come, that will come back and that will help all of us. And apart from that, uh, doing business in America, we have in 2016 expanded our, our local production there and have put money into it. Actually, the tax reform was very attractive for us and for many companies. Uh, so there were there was not only bad things. Um, I don't want to I don't want to defend anything of the current uh, administration. But what I'm saying is um, we have to distinguish between yeah two different things. Yeah, between what were the actions and what was said and what was threatened and so on. And I'm very happy that. Um, yeah, hopefully democracy in the US is not being harmed and hopefully this election will now go through and we will have a fresh start. Now that you mentioned the, the taxes and the Biden administration is promising to raise the, those taxes again, moderately though, but they probably will. For a larger company like like uh, BASF, Dr. Gomlik, um, the Gomlik, I'm sorry. Um, what what does this mean exactly? Like, um, like, how important is it for you to have a business environment before the pandemic, when we had all the deregulations and the and the tax reform from the Trump administration, when we kind of might see a backlash to this right now? Like, what what does it mean for you? Um, I mean, I, I can only second what um, um, Dr. Kandin just said. Um, the, 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 the tax reform was um, extraordinarily positive um, for us. And um, we also welcomed this um, and the business impact and the business environment in the U.S., of course, um, was always good. Um, if there is a backlash, um, it, it, it's a bit difficult to, um, I, I think, to... To, 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 to evaluate what this would actually mean because it would um, mean knowing where exactly the taxes would be turned back and it would also mean understanding what this would mean on, yeah, on the trade side actually and, um, and, and for tariffs. And so, so I think the, the, I, I actually have difficulties answering the question because it's simply it's it is too much speculation. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, absolutely. Um, but maybe on a, on a second note, um, I know it's hard to speculate about um, about the future. But but the Biden, but President elect Biden made pretty clear that he is interested in solving the conflict with China, which is important for BISF as well because it's a huge market for you as well. Um, is there maybe um, I'm interested in what a company like yours need? Like, what kind of signal do you need from from the U.S. administration? to be able to operate free and successful in a, a globalized world like this? I think what we need as a signal is, um, yeah, is, is the preparedness for dialogue. Um, what we need, it, it, of course, um, taking back the sanctions that are out there at the moment would be a very strong signal, even though for us in the chemical industry, this is of course not the, the, the main issue um, as we're not directly targeted. But um, but but um, be, being prepared for dialogue on WTO and um, and, and the dispute settlement um, body, um, being prepared for dialogue with Europe on China and um, and and on, on going forward together and um, and also on finding and. and also on, on finding some agreements, um, for example, on standardization and, and restarting the dialogue that we had under TTIP. Of course, not as a TTIP because we, we don't really see that that would be coming. But of course, but we've um, but we've but the EU has also um, just um, in its recent communication spoken about um, other agreements um, where we would welcome negotiations, and um, and the US actually 
going for these negotiations and and um, being open for the dialogue with Europe on all these difficult questions um, would be a very good and strong signal for us. Um, and also, of course, on the Paris Agreement and on climate protection to see that we as a world, as, um, as, a, as, US, as, as a transatlantic partnership also um, w can find a joint agreement on this because the um, what, what's going on in Europe at the moment and um, on the question on how we achieve climate neutrality and CO2 neutrality um, by 2050 will impact strongly the way that our trade yeah, our, our trade um, environment is shaped, and um, and finding a dialogue and finding find yeah and fi fi finding a um, joint um, yeah and, and, and finding a joint position on this would um, would be very um, would, would would be a very strong signal for us. That's very interesting. I mean, in, but in order to find this joint approach or this interest to dialogue, Mr. Riele, um, President-elect Biden must, prob must probably navigate between the different interests. And, um, and you are based in the Midwest, with, with it, which is super important for the, for the trade conflict. Um, and probably I'm, I'm just interested when you talk to your business partners there, what do they think about um, the trade relations to the European Union and in regard to China? Like, um, is there maybe a push um, uh, towards Washington to keep this kind of uh, harsh approach um, against both trade partners? Um, so what, what do you hear when, when you talk to your business partners um, there where you live? It depends on what business you are. If you are affected by, by China, <clears throat> Um, uh, sure, we have some, there are some companies, uh, they face stiff competition, uh, price dumping. Uh, it's clear that they are not amused about the Chinese uh, 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 competition here. Uh, I don't hear so much about um, Europe, but what, what I hear is, and I can only underline what Ms. Gomlik says and, and Mr. Van Dien, uh, we need the dialogue and that the politicians talk to each other not tweet a, a, a about each other. They have to talk to each other. And, and I think uh, we touched a very important point before COVID and before this administration, we had already trade difficulties, different standards. Why do we need uh, in, in Europe a, a certain uh, approval and then we need to go through the, uh, the entire process again with FDA? That adds only cost and we are less competitive. We have different standards in Europe, in Germany, in the US, and, and we have a metric and, 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 and a different system here. Uh, we have uh, double the or redundant work to do in engineering uh, uh, to comply with, uh, with the standards. And we never touched that. It, that was four years off the table uh, in the discussions of TTIP, what is the benefit of TTIP? I remember, remember these discussions in, in several panels and uh, we never touched that. And I think we should go back here and do our homework with, and I'm, I'm really excited about having that opportunity because I believe that the new Biden administration will talk uh, uh, and will talk to Europe and will talk to, uh, uh, to China. And that's the only way to solve these issues together. There is no way uh, to, to place another threat that doesn't get us anywhere. We saw that in the last couple of years. You know, and that's my hope. And I think it's really, uh, uh, really important to think about also about these basic uh, trade issues we have. They are not resolved uh, until now. Then you're on the same page with the president-elect who said to the New York Times, I just quote here, it's going to be a major priority for me in the opening weeks of my presidency to try to get us back on the same page with our allies. Sounds positive in theory. Not sure about the actual outcome in reality in those challenging times. Daniel Andrich, um, I sometimes wonder, it's what on earth happened to the transatlantic trade agreement? I mean, there, there were talks and they were in the very beginning, but Juncker, we remember uh, Juncker standing in the Rose Garden of the White House, shaking hands with, with Donald Trump. Do you see um, 
another trade agree agreement between Europe and the US coming within the next years? How optimistic are you? I think um, before we kind of engage in any kind of agreement or form or dialogue on that, we first have to resolve a couple of issues which are on the table still and have been uh, in place for a couple of years. Um, there is the question about the Section 232 national security um, reason for you know, imposing tariffs uh, on imported goods, which are in place for steel and aluminum. There's always been the, Dr. Grandin might say, noise about the car um, tariff issue, which are, which state noise and were not, you know, actions, but still, if you create noise, you create uncertainty. And that's what Peter Riele was alluding to. And this is always harmful for business. So everything which creates more certainty in a time of unstable uncertainty through the pandemic and various other issues we have globally will help uh, to move a little bit closer together in the transatlantic level. So we need to focus on this first bucket. Um, there are other issues which are a little bit more complicated, you know, the Airbus and Boeing situation and the tariff and retaliation. Uh, which are affecting also other businesses uh, that export to the US and vice versa. We have some other you know, topics related to digital services and so forth, and you can make a long, very, very long list. So I'd rather focus on these quick, uh, um, if you want quick wins to uh, reduce and roll back uh, actions, which are, you know, everybody would probably agree have not been very helpful uh, within the transatlantic relations. And then find common ground and common interests, not only common values uh, on issues like how to deal with, you know, China. We've been talking about this a little bit already on the major challenges which come with this situation on state owned enterprises, on competitiveness on forced technology transfer, on joint ventures and so forth, um, to find common ground there and work together. But this is also homework for Berlin and Brussels. It's not only about you know, um, Washington DC and the US to make the first step there. We really need to have the political will also here in Germany to engage in a dialogue uh, on these issues uh, and also in Brussels. So, will be active uh, here in Germany as well as in Washington, uh, you know, the um, US Chamber and other organizations will be to pursue a way where we can find sort of a um, common approach to transatlantic. And I wouldn't call it TTIP and I wouldn't, we're definitely not asking for this um, at this point of time in this holistic comprehensive approach, but rather focus on, you know, compartmentalized and, and quick wins there. But do you think that uh, large countries like Germany and France are even ready for compromises? I'm just thinking about um, the whole issue of the agriculture uh, topic, uh, which probably is, an, um, is, is very important to solve before we can go to the topic of uh, industrial standards and, tr and tariffs, because the US, US will keep pushing on getting a foot into this market. So do you think that the major players, Germany and France, are ready to do a compromise on this? this so on the, agri uh, on the agricultural sector, I would give you the phone number of my colleague in France to talk about this, probably more uh, helpful for, for you. Um, I, will, I will say this. A couple of days, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership has been created. The world around the US and Germany and the EU is turning. Things are moving very quickly. China is very active in the Asia region. They make the move there. I mean, we can talk, you know, amongst trade uh, aficionados, you can, you can talk about this agreement if this is how, how big of a change that is, but it, it sends a signal. We've been talking about issues on the transatlantic level, which didn't really bring us forward over the last years. And I'm not blaming anyone here uh, and I'm not looking for mistakes on one or the other side of the Atlantic, but really things are moving quickly and the pandemic accelerates a lot and the effects for companies are massive. So we should really get our things together here in Europe to engage in a dialogue with the US on you know, tackling these global challenges. And that's the only thing I'm, I'm really concerned about. Uh, we will come in an election year next year in Germany uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, 
the, the campaigns and the political parties have to address these challenges too, I think. Dr. Grandin and, and Mr. Riele, what exactly is the, the Bundesregierung, the German government is supposed to do as a next step in kind of navigating the trade war with China and also with the US. For, for, from a business perspective, what is the most important thing Germany is supposed to do within, let's say, the next six months, like in a short period of time? Well, I, I guess creating, again, a, a, a relationship. And, um, and, and focusing on the right things, yeah? Uh, and Mr. Andrich just said it in other words, I think we have focused on the wrong things <laughs> in, the, in, in the past on, or on many wrong things. And when we, when, we, when we look at TTIP, for example, yeah? And I, this is connected to my answer to your question, yeah? When we look at TTIP, we as Europeans, we love to forget over the last four years with Trump and everything, we, are, we like to forget that we had a big role in blocking this. Yeah. So the, it was not the, the it was not just the U.S. It, it, the Euro, the Europeans were focusing on, yeah, I think minor things. Yeah, and and we're blocking that. And we have to, like Mr. Lilo also said, we have to have common standards in the future and so on. So in the next six months, what we, what we have to somehow, maybe we all also have to make the one or other say, say sacrifice and show the US, well, we are also willing to, to um, uh, cooperate with you, we give you this and we take this and we have to come to a dialogue. And the other thing that I really, what we really have to do, especially as Germany is one of the leading countries in the EU, um, that we have to focus on uniting the EU like Mr. Andre said, the world is turning around us, and uh, we are we are kind of forgetting this, and uh, uh, and we are busy with ourselves, and we have to make sure that there is a certain counterweight, and we will come to China later, hopefully, and there has to be a counterweight to the strategy that China has, and if we don't if we don't do this together, yeah, we will be the losers of this whole process. I can, I can only underline dialogue is number one and be open-minded and listen. Uh, I think we are missing that from both sides in the past. Uh, and, and being Germany as an export nation, uh, we need that North American market. It's the most important market. It's a very attractive and stable market for German companies. Uh, so it's essential for us that we talk to each other uh, on, on, on a, a political level. Uh, I think, uh, and it's important for the automotive industry, it's important for the machine tool industry, and let's not forget we have another uh, um, export uh, article icon in the United States, that's our uh, dual education, it's our apprentice programs which we implemented here in the United States very successfully, uh, and it helps our German companies to do business very successfully uh, in the United States despite the fact that we have a COVID-19 pandemic going on, uh, we never stopped on that. As a, there are very positive aspects. We need each other. Uh, we need also China. China can produce all the goods they can do, but if there is no consumer, and right now we have a problem in the US with the consumer, 70% of our GDP depends on private consumption. So it, it sounds maybe funny, uh, but if we don't go to restaurants, if we don't visit and travel uh, to Disney World and Universal Studios, we are missing a, a big portion of that economy. It's a huge economy. Every American can spend uh, uh, $62,000 per year. We are talking about 21 trillion. Uh, so it's a very attractive market. And dialogue is number one to keep that market uh, going for all of us. It's a networked and interlinked world. There is no Asia, there is no Europe or, or North America and South America on its own. We are all in this together. And, and I think, as Mr. Grandin said, we focused in the last couple of years uh, on, 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 on the wrong, uh, we had not the right priority, maybe not, uh, not the right things to discuss. I remember discussions, TTIP, um, first of all, it was rejected. 
yeah, because of chlorine chicken and, and other uh, kind of interesting uh, aspects of it, and then all of a sudden uh, everybody would like to have it. Uh, it was on the table and we were defocused. It's not blaming one or the other side. That's why I say dialogue. That's really what I see extremely positive what's happening now. And the dialogue is the first step to agreements. And I think that's, that's the key. Remember the chlorine chicken. I think everyone remembers that. Um, uh, Dr. Gomlich, before we open the, uh, the, this panel to the questions from the audience, which I encourage everyone to type in the chat window, um, do you have another kind of final thought on the, um, like how an effective transatlantic uh, response to the US trade conflict China is supposed to look like? Um, is there anything um, you think is important, uh, especially the German government is supposed to do? Actually, I think before Europe can actually start finding um, finding common ground with the U.S., it's it's um, most important that Europe gets its stuff together itself. And then because we will only be an attractive partner and will only be strong in dialogue if we have a strong economy, if we have a very strong industry, and um, and. I, and, and that's why I said at the beginning, it's very positive for me that I'm seeing Europe identifying this and seeing this and recognizing it and also addressing this challenge to, um, to find an industrial strategy, to, um, to, to align climate policy and industry policy, that these um, thoughts are being had and are being discussed and the um, conflicts of interest that are out there are being addressed. Because I think that if we don't face this challenge that we have internally in Europe, um, we are not going to be strong enough and will not have a strong enough industry to actually be a satisfactory partner for the U.S. And, um, and I think we need to have a very strong economy to be able to start all these discussions on standards because we, don't, we, we, because we shouldn't forget we've been having these discussions on standards for years, for decades, actually. I mean, we had the Transatlantic Business Dialogue, Transatlantic Business Council before, um, before TTIP. And, um, and we never really found alignment on many of the standards that were then part of the TTIP negotiations. So, um, so yeah, um, I, 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 I think that that is actually the main, the main issue that we have here internally. And then, of course, um, yeah, standards, I think, is the main issue that we need to have um, for, for, for the dialogue with the U.S. Because when we see what China is doing with, um, with, with um, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, they're basically setting standards along, um, uh, along Belt and Road. And, um, and by giving money to, um, to economies, um, they are, in fact, selling their own standards, their own um, um, their, their, their products, and with these products, their standards. And, um, and same is ha happening with RCEP. Um, where we also have, um, an, by, by, uh, by a stronger alignment of the Asian economies, um, we, um, we will also see um, yeah, um, better integrated value chains, and better integrated value chain, chains also mean a stronger and better interlinkage of standards. And then, so if the EU and US want to challenge this, um, yeah, that is one of the main fields I think that they need to start finding um, common ground on after and maybe in parallel to addressing all the other challenges that are out there. Very interesting points you made. Um, I have a few questions from the audience here. Um, some of them, uh, obviously, like the, the people are very interested in, uh, in, in, in China and uh, we, we tackled a few aspects before, but I would like to ask um, maybe we could go a bit deeper into the topic um, first of the transatlantic trade relations. Um, and there's, for example, a question, how, like in detail, how could a transatlantic trade agreement look and how quickly could negotiations start? Like um, just try to go a bit away from the theoretical talk to the uh, to the practical talk. So uh, is there anyone who would like to answer this, this question? Otherwise, I think it might be um, a good question for Mr. Andrich, but maybe someone else uh, would like to answer that question. How could a TTIP 2.0 look like and how quickly could negotiations start? Or I myself have to, have to answer it. It's no problem. It's working. <laughs>
Do we have a freeze here? Probably. Now, is that possible? Can you hear me now? Yes. I have some troubles with my uh, transatlantic data transfer probably between Annette Meiritz and me at this point. Um, another issue which uh, should be part of any kind of negotiations probably to uh, secure a free data flow between the US and Germany, um, which has been uh, kind of in a um, in the meantime, we, we have to work on that, uh, I would say. So, I mean, uh, this is obviously, you know, you, you can make a, a laundry list or wish list what you what you would like to have in the, in the transatlantic agreement. I mean, everything that helps to come together is, I think, very specifically helpful. Um, I, we have to wait for, you know, as you know, um, the change in personnel after the inauguration within Washington, um, when it comes to the United States trade representative, but also, you know, Department of Commerce and other players there uh, within the White House. Uh, normally, after uh, each four years, there are a lot of people are, you know, um, changing their positions there. And with a new administration in place, that would, would take some time. Uh, I guess I'm not quite sure how uh, long it took last time to have a USTR in place. I think this was one of the last um, um, candidates which were uh, confirmed by. Uh, Congress. Um, so this would take some time, obviously. In the meantime, we should really try to work on reducing the ones which have been imposed for, for us, not really understandable reasons. That would be the Section 232 steel and aluminum um, import uh, um, tariffs. Uh, uh, we, it would be also very helpful to have a clear word on um, 232 related um, uh, investigations on auto imports and that they will not affect the national security of the US, that would also be very, very helpful. Because as I said earlier, if you not moving forward on these kind of say, it will be hard to tackle the bigger issues. On standards, and I couldn't agree more on, uh, you know, what uh, Skomli from BSF said, we've been talking about uh, this for decades. It feels sometimes we've been talking about this for centuries within the transatlantic relations. It's, it's, it is really a hard uh, process because it, it goes into you know, various details. But um, I think the effect of you know, how uh, China you know, affected with their business uh, sort of reaching out to other countries and setting standards there in their agreements, this also puts pressure on getting um, together on the transatlantic level and talk about other uh, topics too. Within the WTO, you know, the Airbus uh, and uh, Boeing case, I think as much as I understand, but maybe uh, we have other insights, there's, it's basically currently about the number and the, you know, the volume um, which uh, we're talking about in this uh, case, but this is different which is made to tariffs uh, instead of aluminum. Um, the WTO made a decision there, and I hope we can find a solution quickly. Thank you for the input. There's also like there are many interesting questions. Um, I, re I really like this question, um, uh, like talking about the pandemic and how the economic relations between the US and the EU and China can actually develop during this pandemic. Um, there's one question. Can COVID-19 be seen as a game changer for those transatlantic uh, narratives on trade and the economic on the positive or negative side? And related to that, how do actually all those major partners uh, will be able to negotiate in a time of a pandemic when everything is virtually, when you cannot really build trust? Um, does anyone have a thought on that? I think that's very interesting. I would not say game changer. I would not go to that extreme, but uh, clearly what we as companies do, we uh, restructure our supply chain. Uh, due COVID-19, we saw a lot of gaps and mishaps happening in our supply chain. And our strategy here in US at, at Wittenstein, I can speak for Wittenstein here, uh, is clearly localize more, produce more in the United States to be, become more independent of the supply chain chains, um, regardless uh, Europe or, or China, um, uh, because we, we saw how, how, how critical it is in the last nine to 10 months and how much management and struggle was necessary and how much money 
you have to spend to keep the supply chain going. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, already, uh, you know, air freight uh, uh, going through the roof because there was no, no airplane available uh, uh, and all these struggles we had. Uh, and, but clearly locally sourcing and rethink your supply chain, second sourcing and so on and so on. I think uh, that's COVID-19 is here kind of a, a, an accelerator catalyst, uh, whatever you, you name it. The same applies for a home office or a remote virtual work, work with virtual teams. I think we saw clearly that we could do more. Can we go to extreme of 100%? I think uh, you cannot replace a customer visit or a trade show. Uh, that's what we are missing. It's not possible right now. Yes, we have a lot of virtual events and stuff, uh, but um, there's something missing that has to come back. Uh, that's at least uh, from our perspective. I, I would like to to add. I think it's a. I think it should be a wake up call for all us, all of us. Yeah, and when you talk about like uh, the transatlantic relationships. First of all, Mr. Riele just said it, localizing. I think uh, everybody who was very dependent on, on China in the supply chain uh, is now rethinking um, how to do this. And everybody who, who wasn't is very glad <laughs> that, that, uh, that the company wasn't depending on that. It also shows us um, for example, how not, not only how important personal talks are and, and trade shows and these things, but also, for example, try to get people to work on machines. Yeah, we, we are, for example, we are very dependent that sometimes we support um, our production in the US with our own people, fly them over and so on. Now, today we now try to do this with data glasses and things like that. Yeah, but it's certainly not the same like, like uh, going over. So also there with the new administration, um, first of all, I hope there will be again some certainty because my feeling is contrary, for example, to Spain and Italy who came back very strongly in June, July already after they had a shutdown, uh, the business came back. I have the feeling the US is until today totally paralyzed. Yeah, and that has to do with uncertainty because of how the how the administration was dealing with um, with the pandemic. Yeah, what people could do and couldn't do. The press was also putting oil into the fire so that people are frightened and so on and so on. Yeah, so um, I think um, we need clear again and, and clear clear rules on the one hand and. Uh, reliability, because otherwise, uh, if you don't have reliability, you couldn't you couldn't do couldn't do business. Yeah, and I think that's also one very important aspect now after the uh, after the election that not only in the transatlantic relationships but also internally that the U.S. this this huge let's say yeah you have basically a canyon between these two. <laughs> To parts of the country, and it's it's getting worse and worse, and uh, that makes us as a, as entrepreneurs also extremely uncertain because we don't know how this continues. So we are again, I'm I'm excited that we will have a change now. Thank you. That's an interesting um, question. May, oh yeah, sorry. Please go ahead. I'm yeah, I, I just um, I, I absolutely agree with the points that um, that that my co-speakers made. I mean, when when it comes to home office digitalization, um, yeah, the the way we work together that that has had a huge impact, and I think will absolutely change our business culture. Has changed it, and that will stay not not totally. I hope um, because I'm really missing personal contact. Um, but um, yeah, but that will change. But I think what will also have a huge impact, and I, I don't know how far we will be seeing that now, is that we there won't be much money left in state households, because there because everything is being spent now, and then there there are these trillions that are out there that are being spent on um, yeah on all the COVID recovery programs and all the um, the aid that we need um, to support businesses now. Um, yeah, but um, I mean in Germany um, at the moment um, there there's still um, putting all this money out in the household, but I don't know what will be left in the next legislative period starting um, next next fall. 
and how much money they will still have left. And then that will also impact them in how far all these transitions that are going on will be able to be financed. Um, I think that's also a chance, of course, because that means that um, that that um, the state has to really start thinking about what they demand of business and um, and in how far this can actually, how much this can cost us. And, and so we'll really need to look, um, need to see that regulation is to the point and doesn't cost more than it absolutely needs to um, so that we can achieve the transition in spite of this challenge. But I think, oh yeah, cost pressure, um, money pressure from, from the state um, will also be something that we'll have to deal with and that will really change the way um, the next couple of years work. While you are while you are speaking, there's uh, there's another question directly uh, addressed uh, to you, Dr. Gomlich. Um, it's an interesting one and maybe a controversial uh, one. Um, uh, Mr. Seidel is asking that uh, BISF has made the most important investments in China, and you have an impact um, to the whole whole Asian region. Um, is BISF supporting the Belt and Road Initiative of the Chinese government? Um, yes, that's. That's the question. Um, of course, China is a huge market for us. I mean, I, we absolutely agree. And of course, yes, um, we're investing in China. Um, and um, this is our largest investment to date. Um, it's 10 billion um, that we're investing in a new um, Verbund site um, just outside um, of, of Hong Kong. And um, um, but, but when it comes to um, to Belt and Road, and this is an initiative where we, of course, participate in where there are chances for us, where there are infrastructure products, uh, pro projects, um, where we are, of course, interested in also investing. But um, we, I, I, I wouldn't say that um, as, as a company, we can actively participate in Belt and Road um, as, 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 as a stakeholder. I mean, we, we're a taker, of course, as everyone else is, but we don't shape. Um, so, um, yeah, that, 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 that will be the part. Uh, apart from that, of course, China is a very important market for us. It will um, be the largest chemical market for chemicals um, by 2030. So um, that's why we're there and why we, of course, um, engage um, in China and with all the difficulties that may have. When we talk about China and we talk about um, uh, uh, state resources money-wise, we have to talk about infrastructure as well. And I see here in the in the question section that there is an um, interesting um, comparison between the infrastructure in the in the Asian regions and the infrastructure in Europe. Um, and there there is an interesting question uh, that how important a good European rail rail network is for for those goals to have a like a blooming business a booming business. Um, uh, the, the, um, Katharina Schewe is asking that she was reading in the newspaper that deliveries need 14 days from England to Nordrhein-Westphalia, but um, from Shanghai to Duis Duisburg, they only need 12 days in comparison. So the question to you, to you here as business executives, how important is this, um, is, a, is a great infrastructure um, from an investment standpoint? And do you think there will be any uh, in improvements uh, be seen uh, within the next years in Europe? Actually, um, as we are involved in infrastructure, because we do uh, so-called geotextiles that are being used in building roads and, and, um, and railways and so on, um, I think it's very important. But what I also am, uh, yeah, convinced, and this is actually a threat for us, it's not going to get better in, in the next, uh, especially in Germany, in the next one or two years, because what we see is at the moment, because of the pandemic, um, all the uh, planning institutions uh, and, um, and also certification bodies, they are all working from home, but they don't have computers and they are not digitized. Yeah, so all these things, when, uh, for example, plannings for new roads and so on, will be now very much delayed in the next 12 months. And we will see the result then in uh, 2022. Yeah, so, um, and it shows again how Europe and especially Germany is very much behind other regions, for example, Asia. Uh, so this is not just Berlin Airport or things like that. It's really a systemic problem. 
Yeah. And the other problem that we have is that we have a bidding system in Germany where the cheapest wins and not the most ecological, uh, ecological friendly or fastest. And that's what you see, for example, when, when roads are being built, you see that these um, construction sites, they last for one year, where in the Netherlands, you can do this in, in uh, four to eight weeks, the same thing. Yeah. So again, this is again a very good example how Europe is being more and more behind other areas, which is uh, has much to do with our bureauc bureaucracy, because when you then look at the vaccines, you see technolo technologically we are very far uh, beyond other, other countries, but with our bureaucracy, we are just too slow. Mr. Andrich and Mr. Riele, um, our participant Albert Jennings is interested in the reputation of German companies abroad, uh, which I think is an, an interesting question to ask. And he's asking, has Made in Germany had a negative impact in the US following the diesel scandal with Volkswagen or even Wirecard? Um, when we talk about reliability, has the German image or the reputation gotten tarnished there? What is your experience from, from your time in DC, uh, Mr. Andrich, and maybe uh, Mr. Riele as well, living in the US? What, what is your experience as well? Maybe I, I start <clears throat> because I like that question. A quick answer, absolutely not. The opposite is the case. Also made in Germany uh, has an, 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 a very, very good reputation. German engineering. German uh, uh, educational system has an excellent reputation in the United States. And there is no dent, there is no negative impact on the diesel scandal or wire card or a building in 10 years in, in Berlin, an airport about organization and project management. I don't hear that from employees. I don't hear that from customers or anybody. Uh, the opposite is the case. Our products, our German engineering, especially German engineering made in USA, has an extremely high reputation. Also there's zero damage. I never heard that from anybody that uh, uh, German, engineers are, German engineers are cheating and, and are unreliable or whatsoever as a, as a result of the diesel scandal. Nobody talks about that. Also none of our customers and customers are Tesla, SpaceX, and many, many other companies here, big companies, Procter & Gamble. I never heard that in any of our discussion related to our skills, uh, our engineering. That's what, uh, what, uh, what our value add is, and that's what our customers discussing with us. Um, we never had a discussion. I never heard anything. I never read about it, uh, uh, that Germany has a, a, a received or in, that there is a negative impact on our reputation of our skills, our engineering, our quality, uh, and our reliability. It's a very, very a huge asset we have in the United States, and that's uh, has um, there's no zero impact. And that's at least uh, what what I see. Maybe Daniel, uh, you share with uh, with us your experience. Almost nothing to add there. Thank you, uh, Peter, for uh, you know this plaidoyer, as I would say. Um, and, and I mean the numbers speak for themselves. This is not only I can only add on this. You know the couple of hundred thousand jobs created by German-owned affiliates in the U.S., but on the other side too, a couple of hundred thousand jobs created by U.S.-owned entities in Germany. Uh, and if you look at the numbers and the investments and the trading relationship, the business relation, the commercial relation between uh, Germany and the US is super, super strong and has a decades long and maybe centuries long history, uh, companies and customers working together. Um, obviously it normally starts with trading relationship then you know, investments follow, then job creation follows. But uh, of course these numbers are, you know, show that, that um, the, the, both economies are highly interlinked and we should really focus on that, I think. And also on the core strength uh, I always like these great examples, you know, where German manufacturing solutions meet platforms in the US, uh, digital processes there, and they have a huge understanding about their customer and how this can be beneficial for German, uh, you know, for family um, owned um, Mittelständische companies in Germany too. So when we really combine forces there, 
uh, and work together. This might be a great outcome, you know, coming out of this pandemic and using the window of opportunity to restart this. Uh, I really think that we can all um, be positive on the effects of that. So the last question I can um, I can ask here, looking on the time, um, it's a total different field, but I think it's very re relevant anyway. So I would like to ask it um, uh, in the open. So how do you see the chances of the planned European data initiative to build a meaningful counterweight, counterweight to the US dominance in that field? We are talking so much about the big tech and the American dominance. So. What are the chances, how are the odds that one day or even in the near future, we will see um, a European counterweight? If anyone wants to answer. Um, I, I, I don't know if we're really um, in this one well-placed um, and not, not as we're all not part of the um, IT industry, but uh, the, the question seems to be referred to Gaia X. Um, I, I suppose, um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, it, it, from from our perspective, it's a very, um, it's a good initiative, and it's good that um, the EU is um, is taking the initiative and and trying at least to um, to build a response. Um, I, we're not really sure on how far this will actually, of course, be successful because the challenge is huge and um, the technological. Um, 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 yeah, and, and the U.S. is technologically far, far, far ahead of, of, of everything that Europe could do. So building a European cloud solution, um, um, yeah, is, is a good initiative to, to really get us together to, to start innovating and um, to start finding common ground and finding out how Europe can actually achieve something here. Um, yeah, in, in how far this project will, um, will be received by the public um, and um, will actually be successful and competitive um, to what um, you, the, the U.S. Um, cloud um, companies um, like, like as Amazon, Microsoft and so on can, um, are, are giving us, I, I, I haven't an answer, I'm afraid. Um, just the last question from me to everyone who's based in Germany right now, just to wrap this up. Um, do you dare to book your US summer vacation yet? Or are you more, are you rather pessimistic that we have to live with a transatlantic travel ban for a while? I mean, I haven't booked my, uh, you know, uh, private any plans for any vacations, but obviously this this uh, is a, a problem for a lot of companies that they cannot get their, you know, skilled workforce coming over the business travel and and I, I assume you know, obviously this is a very difficult situation and uh, for the healthcare sector and for um, you know everybody on on both sides of the Atlantic. So so we have to be very careful there, but we have to also find sort of solutions where you know, businesses can still be part of um, the recovery plan. And this is also relating on how people can move from A to B, but also how supply chains can be stable uh, over the next uh, months to come. Uh, that's a very difficult question for the time being, but um, uh, I hope we can, um, you know, in the next week, some changes will be, you know, made there. Hopefully from a business perspective and from a travel and uh, vacation perspective, uh, which probably is of interest from anyone here, even for those who are based in the US, uh, it's hard to um, do business or professional relations or whatever right now in these times where we're all kind of tied at home, remotely working. Um, and I thank you so much for the interest. Apologies, apologize, apologies to everyone um, whose uh, um, questions I couldn't put into the panel, I'm pretty sure there is the option to, um, to put them in, um, maybe uh, to, to address them again and, and uh, to the, to the MCHEM and maybe they can forward, the, forward them, <laughs> excuse me, um, to each of the participants. Um, thank you so much, Daniel Andrich, Dr. Hans Gandin, Dr. Christina Gomlich and Peter Riele and to everyone who organized this panel. Uh, it was very interesting. I think we covered a broad uh, like range of topics here. Uh, and I hope uh, we, we could, could tackle a few of the issues that are of interest of everyone. Thank you so much and stay healthy. Thank you very much.
Bye-bye. Okay.